Hello and welcome to Dopey, the podcast on drugs, addiction, and dumb shit. And my name is Dave. And uh, we're doing a little YouTube thing. And I'm very excited to have a guest on the show from Queens. You're in Queens, right, Pop? Yes, sir. I'm from Brooklyn, though. So from Brooklyn in Queens, he hosts the Sober is Dope podcast. He runs the Meta is Dope universe. He's making comic books. He's in recovery. Welcome to the show, Pop. What's happening? Thank you very much for having me, my brother. It's always a pleasure. It is always a pleasure for me. Pop had me on his show, and uh, it was one of the first interviews I ever did on video and I'm wearing a bathrobe. I thought I would be like cool <laughs> in the bathrobe. Like I didn't care. <laughs> like the idea was to do the video in the bathrobe because it showed how little I cared. And then when I saw it, I was like, I look terrible. Like I cared way more than I thought I would care. Um, it's funny how, how it's funny yeah. how that stuff goes. Um, so how are you, Pop? What's going on with you? I'm doing well. I'm blessed. I am excited to be alive. A lot of breakthroughs, um, you know, being in New York, you know, I lost a few family members, so it's putting life in perspective. I never thought I'd make it to 42 years old. I'm 42, feel younger than ever. Just started a new diet lifestyle, putting creativity in perspective and what we call legacy and just kind of focusing on what matters and dialing, dialing down on um, what what really needs to be done so we have no regrets when we're old men and we're chilling. So I'm excited, a lot on my plate, but I'm blessed. Thank nice. you. Nice. That's a lot of good stuff to talk about right there. I mean, first I want to know what 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 crazy diet are you on? Well, all right. So I'm on a ketogenic diet, which is, well, lifestyle, but it's a bridge to get back into more plant-based I have a lot of ideas and um, understanding about nutrition, but the problem with me is consistency. So what I meant by crazy new is I'm applying the same tenets that I apply towards my recovery, towards my health now. It's one day at a time. It's, um, I cannot compromise, and there's no wiggle room. I have to take this just as serious as I take my recovery if I want to have any lasting results and to live long and healthy. So I'm very serious about it, and that's what I'm working on right now. All right, I'm with you. I, I'm, I'm actually counting. I'm doing the same thing. I'm counting days now without dessert, and I'm on day three. So day three without dessert. Now, you. I have I have real problems with with food. I did keto. I did keto like last year, uh, and I lost a ton of weight. Um, but it's like I couldn't stick with it. I think my cholesterol went through the roof. And I want to get to plant based, and I I haven't been consistent either. What's what is your weakness with food? Um, my weakness as of late was coffee and the abuse of sugar yes. in my coffee. How much sugar you put triggered in? Triggered a hormonal reaction. How much mm -hmm. sugar you put in the coffee? When I was on some, I don't really give a shit phase. It was more like two or three scoops. And that was just out of shit. I think frustration, a little bit of depression and just like going through a lot. The pandemic did a lot. So it just, I kind of threw in the towel and just say, you know what, I'm going to eat and do whatever I want. And that was out of frustration, but it led to a lot of health problems really fast. Two or three so, scoops. Um, I just gave, I gave Howie, then, I gave Howie five scoops of sugar just now. And he's like, this is how I like it. <laughs> I just, he, he needs, uh, see, I'll tell you what I do with, with, I used to go like this. I used to hold the sugar thing over the coffee like this and let it just go now, but I'm all or nothing. Now I just drink it black. Like I can't put a little sugar in. I just go black with the coffee. Do you put any? You put sweeteners in, yeah. or you black with it? Right. What I did now was I realized that I had to have some realistic hacks so this could work. So what I do is I use stevia, organic stevia, because stevia doesn't raise your glycemic index, right? Um, and it doesn't have a. It, it doesn't really affect 
your bottom line and your glucose level. So it works for me, but I transitioned over to green tea lately and I haven't really now coffee is like a treat because I just figure green tea has more antioxidants. It's healthier. It's cheaper. I could get a big, a big box of organic green tea for like $11, a hundred comes in a box. I save a bunch of money on coffee. Um, you know, from, from the green tea versus the coffee and it feels better. And now I don't even think about the coffee. I haven't had coffee today and I'm wired. I swear. I just feel, I look like you see me when you, I was like, <laughs> but it's cause I'm getting healthy. I'm losing weight. I'm becoming more mindful. I'm walking more. I love the way I feel. And at 42, my body can't really bounce back like it used to when I was 22. So now I realized to master your forties and fifties, you have to be more mindful about what you're doing. You have to give your body a jump start. It doesn't happen on autopilot like it used to when we were younger. So now that mindfulness is kicking in. And it may, it's no fun being sober and clean and having all this remarkable energy if you feel and look like shit, you know? So I said, let me get it together now. I just buried one of my friends who died. They found him in his house because of diabetes. Mm. He passed away. He was only 55. I'm sorry. My dad died at 52 right. of a heart attack, and I'm 42. So I'm like, well, wait, wait, wait. I plan on being around 10 years from now, and that's right around the corner. So I need to get serious about this because people are really getting sick now, and it's no longer a game. I hear you. And uh, and you're a very creative person. Pop is a podcaster. He's a writer. He's a, a musician. He, you know, you're always on the on the creation front. You're always making something. Have you always been like that? Um, no. Uh, the the propensity to create was always within me, but addiction restricted that. And that's one of the things that it took away from me. And that's one of the beefs I have with addiction. It just had me stuck. And I mentally was always in my head creating and I wanted to do more. But the handcuffs of addiction stopped me from doing that. So I have a theory. I said, God is the creator. Whether you believe in God or not, something's out there creating a bunch of things in the universe and making people and planets and I things. So I said, look, always be creating. If you tap into the creative process of the universe and you use that in your life, that staves away one boredom, um, lack of fulfillment, and it gives you a sense of purpose. And I think those three things is paramount in helping someone maintain one recovery but a sense of self-actualization and self. So now, since I found my recovery, it's like a switch was turned on, and I just like 24-7, I go to work, get off work, create till 2 o'clock in the morning, get up, work on creating more, go to work, do the same thing on repeat because it makes me feel alive. And I have a bunch of theories on that, but fundamentally... Everyone could attest to this. When you make something new or you have something new, you want to look at it, play with it, and it gives you, it gives you this level of excitement. Right. You know you know that from the music industry. You do a new song, you want to listen to it all day. Eventually, you'll stop. But when you first make that new song, you just, oh, you just want to re-listen. It's just so exciting. You want people to hear it. So to continue that energy is one of the things I do. By creating, I'm keeping myself young, excited, full of vigor and promise, and it keeps me grounded. Right. Um, I love that. And I love, I, I used to make music and I, and I was exactly the same way that I would, uh, if, if we put out a song, we recorded a song, I would listen over and over again. Podcasting isn't the same thing because you don't want to listen to it. You certainly don't want to listen to it over and over again. And it's long. Yeah, maybe but, once, right? Maybe once. I don't even, I can't even listen to it once. I mean, like uh, this week, <laughs> it was the anniversary of my, of Chris's death. And when we do these shows, I wind up listening, right? I wind up listening to the old shows to kind of put a show together. And it's, it's not like listening to the song, but when you're creating the song, if you don't do the next song, you're fucked, right? Because like you get, you get stuck, you need to do the next one so that you can keep the, you know, the renewal happening. How bad was your, uh, addiction what was your addiction like what was your alcoholism like you started a whole world called sober is dope a movement meta is dope which i like but it all it, was it all born in 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 alcoholism no man and pop you can who i am as a person i come from very creative people 
um, beautiful family, uh, always been doing music. My brother, one of my brothers is a priest, the other one is music. My younger brother, my sisters, we all do stuff. Um, come from great grandparents, good, good family. Um, my, the, so my creativity comes from, that's the, well, God gave me that. That's just, that was intrinsic for me. The thing was to answer your question real plainly, uh, my addiction was terrible, horrible. And not like, you know, to compare, you know, with addictions, you know, it's not one person's addiction is more worse. It's all ugly and it's all sad. But for me, it just was like I was trapped into this cycle of depression and the chemical dependency. And I, it just was nonstop for this, like, short period in my life. It went from just drinking, being a wild guy who always had these adverse effects of alcohol and would always go manic and crazy and being a music artist and having all of this energy and being a pop character. I was super, I was wild as a young cat. Like I was a Brooklyn kid out there doing music, always had a beautiful girl with me, just doing my thing. And the pop energy was what people loved. They were like, that's pop, the life of the party, go crazy with it. But as I got older, it started just like really attacking me. Like the addiction got worse. I lost a few things and um, people that I loved in my life, things that I had in my life, careers. And the depression started setting in. And then I realized I was stuck with this thing called alcohol. I would wake up in the morning and be like, why do I feel like my whole world is shaking and moving? My whole equilibrium and nervous system was off. I would hear a penny drop and my whole equilibrium would shatter. I was like a nervous wreck and I would be disheveled and I'll be disconnected from reality. And then the only thing that would make me feel better in that horrid moment would be alcohol. I, go, I needed a beer, trigger warning. I needed my beer, my bogey, and my brandy, trigger warning. That was my thing. And then once that ran out, my whole objective was how do I get it again? And it was a single-minded mission Day in and day out, as things got worse, because I have a very long story. Um, but if you read between the lines, by the time my story got critical, it was this day in and day out behavior where all I could do was focus on that. I needed to drink. And that would normalize me. I will feel good. Then I will go to bed. Then I will wake up feeling worse the next day. And it will be more compounded nervous system distress and shook energy and just shaking energy and lost and it was just ugly nasty and dark and it got to the point where I kept losing relationships I kept losing the respect of the people that I love and um and then it got to a point where I had nothing I was pretty much I had this two-week run where I was homeless in New York and it was in the winter of 2012 or 2011 and I remember that November, that cold winter, I remember just like, dude, just struggling, man. And um, one day I was trying to stay with one of my friends in East New York. And he was like, well, you can't stay in our place. When I leave in the morning, you got to leave too. And I would just roam around. And one day I was just walking and somebody threw a cigarette on the floor. And I looked at the cigarette and I thought to myself, now, if you could imagine, this is like a movie that slick, the guy flicked the cigarette so you can see the cigarette, it's the cigarette flying through the air in slow motion. It hits the floor and it starts bouncing on the concrete. My eyes are fixed to the cigarette. I start to think to go move towards if I could just get that cigarette and that's when it all hit me. I said I went from being the great Pop Buchanan for $1.5 million brownstone in Brooklyn, college graduate, real estate mogul, industry artist, life of the party, most celebrated, one of the most celebrated family members to being homeless and about to pick up a stranger's cigarette. Um, and I just got on my knees in the middle of Brooklyn and started crying and praying to God. Wow. I just totally gave it all up in that moment. I had no more desire to play. I said, and I know enough, forget context. My brother's a priest. I was Catholic. I'm mass spiritual, meditate. I knew all of this shit. But it didn't help me until my darkest hour. And that's when I imploded and just humbled myself and broke down and prostrated in the middle of the street and said, God, I am absolutely done. I'm absolutely broken. The devil certainly has me. I need you and every miracle you have. Please help me. 
please help me. I need rescue. And I broke down and started crying. And at that moment, I heard a voice. And that voice, I never stopped listening to. It was a miraculous moment. I don't always boast on this because some people be like, yeah, right, you heard a voice, but I'm deep and I could and I'm just and I and I own my deep shit. And I heard a voice in that humility and it said, get up, go to on the train, go to 14th Street, find a hospital. And I did. I went to 14th Street. I started looking for Catholic hospitals. I broke down to the people in the detox. I had no insurance. They was like, we're gonna have to get you approved. They was about to turn me away. I cried, asked for a miracle. I broke down, told that nurse, I don't want to die. If you send me back out there, I'm going to die. And she was like, she called, she made a phone call. Some important guy came off that elevator. I remember he was an old black guy with a cowboy hat. He came off that elevator. She said he runs the whole department. I think it was St. Vincent or St. Luke on 14th Street. One of them shut down. It was nine years ago, so I have I, I got to figure it out. I think it's St. Vincent. St. Vincent was on the west the side. Elevator. He looked at St. Vincent was like on uh, Sixth Avenue and like 10th Street. Uh, Beth Israel. So Beth Israel is the good Jewish hospital on 14th Street on the east side, though. Maybe you went. Maybe you didn't. Maybe you were so wasted. You thought you were in a Catholic hospital, but you were in the Jewish spot. Maybe right. And and the Jews came to your right, rescue. I was sorry in the Jewish spot. <laughs> hey, fun fact: I have Ashkenazi Jewish blood, so I that that I did fit. The, I fit the criteria. You, I'm yeah. genetically got my yes. Jewish blood. In yes. Me. I did an ancestry. It was like, oh shit, I'm related to Einstein and Wonder Woman, you know? Very nice. So, uh, <laughs> but yo, look, so check this out, man. The guy came off the elevator and he looked at me and he said, young man, what are you doing here? You look good. Well, what is all this about? Are you crying? Like he said, sit down. I said, hey, hold up, hold up, hold up, hold up. Stop drinking. I don't want to. How old were you? Um,. Uh, Oh, was like, damn, I was thir- uh, 40, 31, 31, 30, 30, 30, so, 31, 11 yeah, years ago, nine years ago, nine years ago. Yeah. Nine years ago. Yeah. So I was like, um, I was, I told the guys, I was real honest, man. I had no more bullshit in me and I could spin anything. I could spin anyone. I could, uh, you know, um, and I was just like, listen, I'm I'm a good per- person. I'm certain of that, and I just need help. I don't want to go back out there. I, I was crying. I was like, I I promise you, I come from a good family. I'm a good guy. He was like, I'm not concerned about that. I know you look like a good person, but people come in here and waste our time. If I give you someone else's bed, you'll be taking away an opportunity from someone who really wants help. And I said, no, I'm telling you, I'm going to go all the way. He said, there we go. Promise me you'll go all the way. I said, I promise you I'll go all the way, sir. I'll keep that promise. I'll never break it. He said, congratulations. Welcome to Detox. Go get your, you know, gown and go to the third floor. And that's day one of the Sober is Dope story. That one act of mercy from that beautiful group of people, which I really, des- they deserve for me to remember their names and who the hell they were. So I have to do, I have to do the research. Um... But that one act of mercy saved my life, man. And I'm here today. And one of the reasons why I started Sober is Dope is because of that act of mercy, after four years of me being into my recovery journey, after six years into my recovery journey, I was just living this vibrant life. I had a beautiful job. I was doing my music again. I was healthy. And one day I was driving and I said, yo, you know, I have to do something, I have to tell people about this because I'm just living this vibrancy and it's all based on my recovery. And I, the soap is dope came about in the rehab center because me and the guys in the three quarter house in the rehab, we used to always have these little jokes about what was dope and what was not. And then one day um, I, we was talking about something and I was like, yo, you know what? One of us, we was playing, and we, I was like, you know, it's really dope, though. The sobriety shit is dope. That's how we said the sobriety shit is dope. And we kept saying it. It was like, your sober is dope. So I was like, sober is dope. And then I had an artist do the little logo for sober is dope. Like, I forgot how I did. I had somebody do it because I was on Instagram or something. I hired somebody. And then I used to always keep that logo in my phone, and I never thought about it. I just was like, yo, this is my thing. And then it clicked. One day I just said, I got to talk. I downloaded the app Anchor about four years ago. And I pressed record and just said, yo, boom, I told this story I'm telling you. And that's episode one of the Sober Dope podcast. When I pressed publish, 
I don't know. It was I recorded it and I ain't think nothing of it, but I had pressed another button. And I was like, all right, maybe they're gonna review the podcast or the episode or so go through some process and they get back to me. I'm driving, I go to Spotify to listen to my music, and I see Sober is Dope popped up, and I'm telling you, I almost crashed my car. I could not believe that we just, I just did this thing and popped up on Spotify. And then I'm listening to the episode, and I was like, yo, I got a podcast by default. I just was like playing with the app. I had the app for Mad Long. And then one day I'm listening to another podcast. A lady was talking about Anchor, and I downloaded it. I'm looking, I'm like, let me just press record and I'm talking and I was like, whatever. I closed the phone, shit bounced to Spotify. I never looked back. Episode after episode. And four years later, we have 150,000 downloads and we have over 350 episodes. Well, uh, about, no, about 300 episodes on the Sober's Dope podcast. Um, we're averaging about a hundred episodes a year. I know for some people, the number 150 downloads could be gigantic. And for some people it's very small, but for us, it's 150 people that heard the message of recovery from doctors, from experts, from PhD people, from, we have everyone on a sober podcast, you Dave. Um, and that's 150,000 people lives we potentially affected and that's our life mission, my life mission, and it's part of the service aspect of me giving back to the universe and paying back God once for answering my prayers when I got on my knees to the hospital and the nurse and that, that director who had the mercy to send me to detox, and three, for my family and friends and everyone who um, embraced me with open arms and gave me a nurturing environment to thrive and live in my recovery. And the rest is history, brother. No, I love that. I'm, I want to hear about pop, like pop living the high life. Like when did you become that kind of person in your head? Like where the pop personality, like when it became alcoholic, like when, when did you cross over from not alcoholic to alcoholic? Like when, do you remember like you were a kid, you were, you were, you were, uh, uh, you were doing real estate, you were rapping. Yeah, I think like, it was college. And, and break it down it like that. What was that school. moment? What was that moment where you picked up a drink and you were like, this helps me be who I want to be, the sort of I have arrived moment thing? All right, so I'm going to put it to you like this. And I call it the mighty, mighty dark passenger. That damn super, that, that crazy, powerful fucking alternate universe, excuse my language, that alternate universe creator that's that that person that's within me that I keep locked away and I think the first time when I had a drink by accident just playing around as a kid at one of my family's party that person came through and I think people started now to give you context pop my mother named me poppy my family named me poppy as a baby because i always had energy and was bouncing around it was part of my natural personality to have all of this extreme energy right it, it, the alcohol magnified that but my family tried to warn me they said don't ever drink because you're you're already a tasmanian but you're not a tasmanian devil right you're just already tasmanian so you don't want to like if you drink this you're going to go into supersonic tasmanian level and i didn't really understand why they was warning me but when i first did i was like probably 14 or 15 at a family party i drank a beer and then i drank another beer and then when those chemical explosions happened um huh i didn't say anything oh i'm with you when when that oh i'm sorry i'm here that that explosion happened and i literally man Made it. I, I remember this family party. I was doing break dancing, and it's a super formal party. I'm break dancing, grabbing girls, dancing with them. Now I'm young. I never had this freedom of confidence, but I was always in everyone's face. But now I was just super, you know, super scion. And long story short, I was normal after that for a while, right? I went through high school. I was a, mainly a weed smoker. I was like a, uh, I call myself an artistic renaissance, young hippie type kid. I was modeling. I had a cute little Indian girlfriend that was nice. high. We both smoked. We was into poetry and metaphysical shit like UFOs and gods and universes. And we was always reading these complex books and meditating and listening to Sting and all of this shit, going to Chinatown, getting our ginseng playing in the arcade 
arcade, doing a New York thing, hitting 14th Street, Union Square, smoking in the park after school, doing all of that hippie little New York shit with hip hop in the mix. Um, but it wasn't until I went to college that I was away from home and we was doing the drinking thing. And I had a bunch of episodes throughout the whole college experience. And I was in college for mad long. I was in college for like six, seven years. It was, it was bizarre. Cause I got kicked out my first year from partying and drinking. Then I had to go to another school. I went to BMCC in New York just to get a, I had to get a, a A in two classes so they could let me back into Farmingdale in Long Island. Went to, back to Farmingdale. Now I'm in, that's 1990, 1997 I went to college. 1998 I had to go back. That year off I started modeling. I was on, I did a time after time music video. I was on MTV with Eno J. Hey, fun fact, anyone out there, if you go check out the classic song from Eno J, Time After Time, the Cindy Lapa remix, I'm the young model on the bike, um, riding around nice. New York in Soho with Eno J. And yeah, that's me in the video. And I was modeling. And after I modeled, my mom said, what you want to do? I had modeling contracts. I said, mom, I want to go back to school for dad and them. I got to go back to school. There's like, you can model. I said, nah, I got to go back to college. So I went back to school, calmed down, wound up graduating, but I had a bunch of episodes. So to answer your question successfully, every since that day when I was a kid, every time I drank, it would be this extra, this other being that would come through that no one could stop, super powerful. I could do anything I wanted. I would go to a neighborhood, shut down the whole neighborhood, go to, I was just, a, I don't know. It was some unnatural power. It's like having like some weird Thor God-like power, but you couldn't yield it or control it. So I was very powerful, but I would create a lot of damage and shit. No, I can, um, I hear that you. That shit, didn't, it stopped cute when I got too old and I start and I was around 25, I would say from 25 to 30 was like when it really got critical because I started to just that that's all it became was partying and drinking and partying and drinking and the alcohol took over. And the hippie and shit, the hippie shit start, went by the wayside. Crazy. All, all the New York city, uh -huh. hip hop, hippie shit, like that great stoner time disappeared. It, it it wasn't that it disappeared. I got I I, I I got old and I was so fucking deep and intelligent. I knew so much so much shit that I just thought I had it all figured out. I almost developed a god complex. So instead of me keeping it contained and sexy, alcohol kept it messy. It became messy and uncontrollable. Like I used to just be like a real cool kid. I'd go to the studio, smoke. I'll hide it from my mentor, my stepdad and shit. The whole studio. I, now I think back, the whole studio smelled like weed. He probably just had mercy on me. He's like, you're not hiding it. You guys, I could smell the weed going down the block. Right. But it was funny. That's all we used to do. Every time the alcohol came in, it just got crazy, man. I remember having, the, the, the pinnacle for me is when I had a fight with my mom. And that fight led to my mom looking. She, she, she stopped trusting me. She didn't look at me the same. I woke up the next day. And I'm th I'm like, good morning, mom. And she said, oh, you got to go. Uh, I don't know you no more, and I'm sorry, but you got to go. Wow. And that shit still brings chills to me. That shit just hurt me. Because to see someone that you really love and respect totally just be like, nah, I don't know you, man. You got to go, bro. Uh, I can't. And I was like, but mom, she was like, I'm sorry. You can't ever be here again. So I was like, damn. So when I went, that was after I lost the brownstone, lost everything, I lost so much, guys, um, and that was towards the tail end. After I lost the brownstone, I was just messed up. I had to go back home to my mom, and then one night, I just think all my frustrations, I just, my dad dying at a young age, my addiction, losing the losing to my friends that I really had that meant a lot to me, losing my real estate career, losing my house, winding back at home and being stuck in my mom's living room, with a bottle of brandy under the um, trigger warning, under the cushion, chain smoking cigarettes, watching one stupid ass DVD on repeat that was depressing. Which I one? I forgot what it was. It was some movie I just kept watching. What movie do you think it was? It was, it was that movie with the polar bear. It was the polar bear, the girl with the polar bear. That movie was on repeat, and I was just stuck. And then one day my mom, she asked me something, and I... To, I just took it the wrong way and I snapped and then we started arguing and the argument got crazy. Then the cops came. It wasn't physical, but it was just like loud. And I was just mad. I was pissed, man. And I just was like, 
I think I think what it was was my mom was trying to push me. Like she, I just had got there, and she was like, "So what you gonna do? Are you gonna find a job or something?" And I snapped because I felt like I came from all the success, and I just felt like I came here because I needed a time just to figure my shit out in a safe environment. But I probably felt unsafe because my my mother being a good mother was like, "Nah, you, I'm gonna ask you a bunch of shit, and you got to figure it out." But I exploded, and out of that explosion, I lost a lot of myself. And the guilt just kept mounting. And when she kicked me out, I just started roaming the streets. And that's when I just, that that led up to that two weeks when I was in the wilderness. And then I got on my knees and broke down and gave my life back to God. So to answer your initial story, I think the day when my addiction totally exploded and created this counter personality was when I was really young at that party and I had those beers. But when it became totally demonic and dark was when I had that brownstone and I lost one of my good friends who lived with me that I was with at the time and they left. And then I started losing a lot. And, um, it just was like this spiraling that got out of control. Um, and, and, and long story short, the part of why I say sober is dope was because the antithesis of that or the opposite of that whole reality, that was not dope being strung out, being messed up, right. being cold dependent on this shit so ugly and like thinking about it today i get chills and spooked because it's like no life right there's no door that opens that's just a recipe for disaster and i try to explain to people if they can listen to me closely right now you might be a person that's normally using these things for recreation and stuff or you might normally be just thinking that you can handle this, but you're doing all of this shit in secrecy. You're probably taking pills, trigger warning. You're probably shoot, doing some shit that you think you got under control. And, you don't. and that was my thing. It was a time where I thought I had alcohol under control. And then one day, just because it's insidious, it comes up right behind you like the demon it is and grabs you and shakes you up. I always tell people there's a reason why in 1 Peter 5, 8 in the Bible, God specifically says, or whoever, whatever, with that specific scripture, be sober, be vigilant for your adversary, the devil, walketh around like a lion, seeking whom he may devour. Now, I know one thing about the Bible, whether you believe it or not, none of these guys was wasting their words, bro. They was not wasting words. So there's a reason why he said, be sober and be vigilant. Now that could be sober minded, clear, have clarity, have perspective in your life, be clean, be mindful, be present, but also stop drinking and doing drugs, bro. Cause when the shit hits the fan, you're not going to be in a position to defend yourself, your family, or even your spirit. Right. My worst dream was waking up one day out of a drunken stupor and being on the other side of the world, knowing I died. Right. I give you a perfect example. How many mornings we woke up from drugs or alcohol and we was like, yo, I don't remember what happened. I know I did some crazy shit. And all you wanted was people to tell you what happened and forgive you for what you did. But imagine dying in that moment and being on the other side and not having the ability to even make connection with the people and being that disconnected. That shit spooked me, man. The only other thing that spooks me is being an old man broke in the summertime in New York. I got to be, I got to make about 10 million by the time I hit 70 because I can't be on the New York bus or train at 70 in the summer. I totally <laughs> so, hear but you. But besides that, you get it? Yes. <laughs> but yeah, man, like guys, this is real talk. So that's my thing, man. It's not a glamorous story. It's a story. It was actually sad because the one thing I think about a lot is like, damn, I blew through my twenties and just like the shit that I could have done, man. My family had me get to go to Harvard and all like I could have, I just squandered all these opportunities, just drinking and, but, and chasing the wrong, the wrong things. But the universe makes no mistakes. Cause God was like, nah, you could do all that and be very successful, but I, I'm going to bring you through the long way. And by doing so you might save some lives and you'll have a hell of a story to tell. Because coming back like you did, Dave, from that darkness, you know, is one, miraculous, extremely a big blessing. And as we know, for our friends, Chris, for you, my friend, Eric, that just passed away, and all of the other people who passed away from addiction, some of us is just not that damn lucky, man. No. Right? No. And um, I'm not going to squander that blessing because it's not, it's, it was a blessing. No, I it's all a blessing because you have you have a be- and they didn't- no. Go ahead. I'm sorry, Pop. 
And, and, and you know, 90% of the people don't wake up that particular day and say, yeah, I'm dying. I'm going to die today. Right. They're just using like everyone else. And maybe they use too much. Maybe some asshole laced their shit with fentanyl. And lo and behold, through just sheer life happening, most people get robbed of their life before they have a chance to really reconcile it. Then you have this small subset of people who's living in this darkness addiction so much that it just become a suicidal reality where they just kill themselves. But that's also sad because you're dealing with mental health layers on top of the addiction, which we call comorbidity. And one of the things we talk about on Sober is Dope is a lot is that connection between mental health and your addiction. And when you separate the two, that's when addiction becomes really hard to sustain. And that's when mental health starts to become more powerful. Comorbidity explains that you could have a dual diagnosis or underlying, underlining co-occurring disorder on top of your addiction or on top of your mental health. So for me, the, the, the depression was based on PTSD from the trauma that the addiction brought to me and all of the things that I lost. The relationships and the things that I lost created grief, which affected my vital neurotransmitter hormones, creating more depression. As a remedy for that, I started drinking on top of that because the only thing that gave me dopamine levels to feel somewhat normal was the alcohol. Then once I drink the alcohol, it being depressant further depresses my nervous system. So when the dopamine wore off, I was more depressed. Then the PTSD would come back. Then I would drink more. Then I would get more depressed. Then eventually I became panic mess was, was like, I'm dying and I don't know what to do. And the only thing that makes me feel better, the same thing that is. And it's scientific and it's all about your brain and everything. And it's all connected brain, spirituality, psychological, metaphysical, all of that. So, um, for me, it, it's really about giving people the real deal. Um, because sometimes even through podcasts and platforms, we sugarcoat the shit in a way where it's like, yo, stop playing with your life because you may die and I don't want you to die. This is serious. In the, in the Catholic world and in the church, we call it spiritual warfare, meaning that there's invisible principalities and powers out there that does not like you and that will try to attack you spiritually. That's why a church exists, and that's why all of this shit exists. And then when you laugh at that shit and play with it, and you're like me about to get on your knees and pick up a cigarette in the middle of the winter and you threw your whole life away, what the hell do you do? You go to God and say, oh, you wasn't lying. This shit is real. And the devil absolutely captured me because I'm about to walk on all fours like an animal and pick up a stranger's cigarette. Wow. Mind you, there's nothing wrong with picking up cigarettes off the street because when we addicts, we have to do what we got to do. But that was the one time too many, maybe that it broke, it, it broke me out of the derangement that you fell off, buddy. In Brooklyn, we like to, we all have this term in New York, your son fell off, your son fell off. You fell off, man. Get your shit together. You fell off. And that was the first time I realized Pop Buchanan fell off. Well, it was, a, it was a spiritual awakening. My dad who died. It was a spiritual awakening for sure. It was a straight up spiritual awakening. It, absolutely. But I'll tell you, man, I, I, I used to leave my apartment like only to look for cigarettes on the ground. Like I had I had that as a life uh, in Manhattan and uh, I haven't smoked for a little while, but we were on vacation this weekend and I went to, you know, in upstate New York, I went to the gas station to buy coffee and like there's a picnic station, picnic table outside of the gas station. I sit down and there's a cigarette sitting on the bench and I still wanted to fucking smoke it. And I don't know who was smoking. It was a half cigarette wow. sitting there. And I'm still like, that looks right. pretty good. <laughs> that looks pretty good. Um, I want right, to know, right. first yeah. of all, you you broke down so much shit just there. And I commend you for it. Just to, to recognize how your brain works and all of these, you know, scientific things, spiritual things, and how they work within you. And I mean, it shows you you've done a lot of research and you've done a lot of work on yourself to figure out what the fuck is going on as a just i ask sometimes i ask stupid questions where were you in the two weeks out in the wilderness where did you stay like where did you sleep I, so like i said my friend um author shout out to celsius man my friend celsius was like um i could sleep on his floor but only when he was home 
And this was a guy who was a DJ working two jobs. Right. So it would be like, I might get a text or something three o'clock in the morning, like, yo, come through. And then he'll leave again. And I'll just have to go out. Um, unfortunately, unfortunately I have a real soft heart for homeless people because I never had to really ride the train and do all of that. But it was so detached from just like, you know, I remember one time I'm like, yo, could I just stay like, you going to work? He's like, nah, you cannot stay in my house while you cannot. Not, not for nothing personal. He didn't think I was stealing nothing. It was just his mom and them was like, pop, we love him. He can stay here, but only while you're here because we don't want this to become a situation where the guy's living here. And that happened for about two weeks, man. I would say a good week and a half because I'm counting the weekend. It started on the weekend. And then, but the coldness made it feel like forever. Cause when I left, I had this little jacket, it was freezing in New York and I used to just walk around and I was creative. I would have all of this fun. I would try to walk around. I would try to link up with people and try to get money. The main thing for me is when I try to panhandle a few times, I totally sucked at it, but New Yorkers wasn't. And I thank New Yorkers for this because I see people outside every day and I give them money. I don't care if they in addiction or nothing. I'm like, yo, Whatever you got to do to get through your day, get through your day, bro. Like, I'm not, I will tell you, if I think I know someone's using, I'll be like, you know, it's a better way. You know, you, you know, you go here and get your shelter. You know, you get clean. So stop playing and stop. Don't ask me repeatedly if you're going to keep playing games, but here's $10. Go do what you got. I mean, I'm not going to deny you grace because that might be what you need to get through. But for me, everybody's like, no, <laughs> I'm like, excuse me, sir. Can I have a dollar? No. <laughs> hey, hey, 25. No. And the problem is when I got to detox, they looked at me and everybody's like, yo, you look normal and good. Like I didn't look like anything was wrong with me. I had decent clothes on. I was really handsome. I was much slimmer. I, I look good. He was like, yo, you don't need my dollar. I was like, I am, I need your dollar. Cause I'm broke <laughs> on the inside. On right. the inside. I was a, I was a broken 55 year old that had a hundred ailments at a dying liver and was had a, probably a week to really live. What I found out is when I went to read, they went through everything. They would say, yo, bro, you lost almost more than half your liver. And you're only, you're not even in your, like you just, yeah, I was like 30, 31. It was like, you lost, you, you barely have a liver. Right. And it was like, we might have to put you the treatment, but we got to check your liver enzymes to see when the proteins start to come back to see if your liver replenishes. Like I almost killed myself. They was like, you probably wouldn't have made it. I was shaking. I was about to go into cardiac arrest when I was sitting in front of that nurse. She was like, I don't like this. This kid stabled. I was sweating. Yo, if I didn't have a drink, I'm told my, I would start decompose. Like, I would just break down in sweats and be shaking. And I, I would just feel like it was crazy. And I didn't eat anything that like, I never ate. I didn't drink water. It was so ugly. The only thing I could do was that beer, brandy and cigarettes, beer, brandy. And, and that, that, that dumb ass e, v, um, VSOP and that, 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 um, E and J man. Ugh, trigger warning, man. Just, don't drink and do this stuff. It's bad. It's poison. And I can't explain the poisoning, the poisoning, but I was poisoned, man. It was like, I was just so hooked on this stuff. And like every molecule in my body was just like, we need more of that. It was like an ultimate drug. And I tell people they like to compare alcohol with hard drugs. I'm like, that shit's all the same, yo. It is. Alcohol is mad powerful and it's legal. It Stop. Is. Don't, don't tell me like, don't try to compare alcohol with heroin. Addiction is addiction. Absolutely. Now, I would admit it's harder to probably get off of heroin and alcohol, but the actual effects of the addiction when you deep is that shit is ugly, man. Well, you can die from detoxing alcohol. You can't die from detoxing heroin. And you can't walk down the street and see heroin in the stores. And you can't walk down the street and see people doing heroin in restaurants. It's a much different thing like but the it's deadly you know what i mean and it gets people by the balls and because it's so in, ingrained in the culture it's almost harder alcohol becomes harder in a lot of ways because it's like it you're supposed to be able to drink like a normal person and then it's like alcoholics are like why can't i why can't i you know what i mean you never no one's ever like why can't you do heroin like a normal person you know what i'm saying like it's uh right. it's 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 Listen, I, I, I personally think all addiction is the same, and, and, and your story is ridiculously inspiring. And uh, we were talking the other day, and you were talking a little bit about uh, some of the stuff you're working on now, some of the, the science fiction stuff. 
Um, and I can't help but hear your story and see how this uh, demons and angels stuff fits into your addiction story. So why don't you break down a little bit about uh, this this new world you're creating, the sci-fi. You, you told me what it oh, was. What yeah. was it? Yes. So um, my, my significant other and I, Jennifer, shout out to Jennifer, the evil element rough. And um, I'm, again, I'm Pop Buchanan. Around Christmas time, we said, um, my, my, my girl, used to, she kept nudging me. She was like, you have to get into NFTs and learn NFTs. If anyone out there, NFT is a digital asset, non-fungible token. It could be an image. It could be a document. It could be anything that's on a blockchain as digital. It could be music, videos, anything. Um, it's a unique asset that you could buy and own and keep and resell on a blockchain in perpetuity forever. So um, NFTs was like a thing, but it wasn't I, on my mind. I'm sober as dope and music and doing all of this. And she just, she never asked me for anything like that. She was like, I'm t- it started like in November, she mentioned it. And I gave her a tablet for Christmas, a Samsung tablet. And she was like, can we, can we learn the blockchain? Can we do the NFTs? Can we, can we please, 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 please. And when I sat down and was like, man, she was like, I don't want to miss another boat, man. Like I'm seeing all these people doing this stuff and let's just learn it. She said, you smart, you can figure it out. So I did, I figured it out, but I just didn't want to just sell images for no reason. So for me, it had to make sense. So I said, well, I can, we have to come up with a name. So we try to, we try to come up with crypto is dope, but the Twitter handle was, um, taken and then you know facebook started meta but i used to always call myself meta elohim back i had a a youtube channel that i just never used called meta elohim and um i'm you know part of my spiritual stuff and then it was a beautiful story how my girlfriend and i first connected when she met me on carlton ave in the whole the brownstone where i was using this stuff that's how we met she's still part of my recovery story and we're still together today nice um we had this angel in common. Like I had mentioned to her one day, she was something how the angel Metatron came up. And I said to her, cause I told you guys I was deep metaphysical and all that, but if she's a, a hot chick, I'm like, what you know about Metatron? And she was like, what you know about Metatron? And we started breaking down the angel Metatron. And I was fascinated that this girl knew not none against when women are extremely intelligent and all that, but it was so random right. how she understood this shit on the level that I did. So fast forward 13 years later, cause we've been together for 13 years. I'm trying to put together this NFT world. And then she, we, I'm like, well, what about Metatron? And she was like, meta is dope. And I'm like, meta is dope. And we created this world called Metatron world. So we wanted to build like a, a, a future. It's like a 50 year plan to really build out this universe, but we wanted a universe based in real spiritual entities, real spiritual ideas based on God, where we could trace Metatron is an angel that they, he's in the Ellen Jill for the, um, the, um, the Muslims he's in the, and uh, he has to text in the, um, the Apocrypha, he's in the Christian. He he crosses all barriers. He's a powerful angel. So we figured we could connect him back to God. We could connect that back to Christ. We could connect that back to the seraphim, the cherubim, the heavenly host. But the whole story was like we could build this world where humans alike could connect with the Tron within, the Metatron within. And in each of us, there's a superhero angel waiting to be activated to help the planet. So at different points, you could have different activations of these angels. So our first, our third, our second book, Wacky May, which is out now, is about a, a young lady who's kidnapped by sex traffickers, and these guys kidnap women of a specific sort to feed to this big demon called Craven, which is this man who's a thousand years old. He's half, he's half demon, half human, and he literally collects women and he uses that to keep himself alive. But he picked this one girl who was absolutely an ancient Tron in a human body. So as they kidnap her, they have her blindfolded. And as they try to devour her, she activates her angelic light and she kicks everyone's ass. 
but she's so powerful that she becomes like a superhero because she's half angel, half Tron, and she's we call her wacky because she's like this clown-like, gruesome-looking character, but she's actually a beautiful young lady, but she turns into this big, crazy-looking thing because she fights demons, and she has to look crazy enough to fight them, and that's how we created Wacky May, The Rise of the Trons, um, awesome. the godly nine activation. So it's, it's awesome. It's fun. It's fun. <laughs> and so like, where can people find and, that? And stuff? That's out, yeah. That's out right now on Amazon. You could get it anywhere. You could buy your books. You just go on Amazon, you type in wacky may and it'll come up. You'll see a picture of a, a young girl holding a book that says sold out. And she has like a little black mask on with red eyes and red teeth. And she's holding the guy's head on her lap. It's crazy. It's dark. It's a dark fantasy. Um, you know, now, so how does that tie into the NFTs? We have the NFTs from the books and this Metatron universe for sale on object.com on the Tezos blockchain and sandmilk.com. And you can check everything out on meta is dope.net. Nice. And you can also hear the podcast. Dope is dope.com. Yeah. Awesome. And, uh, listen, I love you, pop. I love your shit. I, I love your I love energy. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, you guys should check him out, and your story is off. To, is crazy, and I and I love it. And I, it, you never did you ever do twelve step or no? You didn't need to. You had religion. You had spirituality. Yes, absolutely. I'm sorry I left that out. I could not be here today. I have to thank Alcoholic Anonymous. The twelve steps is the one fundamental thing that taught me about my addiction. It's responsible for me being an expert on addiction. It made me the doctor's opinion saved my life. Right. Once I understood that I had an allergy and I was allergic, and that created my addiction, and I wasn't a freak of nature. I was actually a normal human being. I just should have never drank, and it just didn't agree with me. And understanding how my brain works. And taking the patience, taking accountability, following the 12 steps. Um, they, without that, I don't think I would have been successful. So shout out to AA is the biggest part of my story. And I could not be here in those earlier days. In rehab, that's what it was. Rehab AA back to the shelter. Rehab AA back to the shelter. That was the first year of Sober is Dope. Once I told that doctor, I'm going to fly straight. I did everything I knew I needed to do. And I gave it the patience that it deserved to work. Well, there it is. Me, I, I appreciate that. And uh, awesome. I'm definitely going to try. I'm trying to get get a pop to do a dopey is dope NFT thing. We're going to do some dopey fucking NFT shit if we can. We're going to do a nice one. I'm going to hook it up for you. All right, cool, We're man. We're going to hook it up. I got you. All right. Well, it's always a pleasure, and uh, I'm sure we'll talk soon. And uh, at the end, we always just say stay strong, dopey nation, and fucking toodles for Chris. So. Thank you, Pop. Toodles from Chris. Yes, peace, sir. Y'all. Let y'all. Love I you too, peace. man. Thank you very much. All right, later. Mm-hmm.